Hello and welcome to the Buckets of Tea MBA show. I'm your host, Catherine Niker. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode. Joining me, favorite of the show, you know her, you love her. It's Katie Heindel. Hi. I was just looking. I was like, I always don't put my name, my handle. You, in the you video. sometimes do. I feel like maybe you switch it up a little bit. I guess so. I was just sometimes you have at what Yeah. You know, you know what it is? I, you know, I'll just be very honest with everybody who, who tunes in onto to YouTube and watches this. First of all, thank you so, so much. <laughs> Second of all, I think I'm the only regular YouTube uploader that doesn't tell everyone to like and subscribe all the time. Yeah. And to follow me all the time, which is like I just should. I should do that, but I don't, I don't you know, whatever. I will. I feel like people respect you more for not. Maybe I hope so. I so I just kind of passively have my handle in the corner, and then it's like, follow me if you want. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, it's cool. That's kind of well, how I feel about it. Yeah, it's like no, it's a no pressure situation. Um, See, but thank you for having me. A pleasure as always to be here. Thank you, and thank you, Raptors Republic, for not putting that pressure on me. So mm -hmm. there's that part too. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. So Katie, we've got a lot on our docket today. And first of all, I have a cold. So I'm going to do my absolute best to do this without coughing. I do have some cough candies on the side. I had I just had some tea, but I'm getting really sick of tea. So I do have some ginger ale and some water. Then we'll try this. What's this? An iced black tea unsweetened pretty good and iced black tea is it sugary, is it it's, sugary? it's unsweetened okay should get them to sponsor the show i should try that i mean i just you know classic canada dry here yeah. you know this is tea it's tea keeping it on the brand for you yeah you are i mean i should you know if i was more business savvy like i said i'd be telling everyone to like and subscribe and to follow me and blah 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 I'd have a tea endorsement by now. I'd Red be Rose, tea. Tetley, yeah. I got that Tetley money, yeah, you know, is. twinnings, <laughs> right? Like You could do like a twinnings, twinning moment. Giving I them away need, free I need, I need help with all the, the business <laughs> side of this stuff. You know what I mean? I'm just, I'm content, baby. I'm content. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then the business, I don't know. I don't know what business I'm in these days, but anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> Katie, I want to talk to you about the moment that women's basketball is having. So, mm -hmm. you know, like as everybody knows, like, you know, Caitlin Clark has like reached a new level this year. I mean, she was blowing up last year too, but this year she reached a new level breaking both the men's and women's record in scoring making it to the finals again, not quite getting that championship, but really has elevated the game, you know, along with Angel Reese, along with Camilla Cardosa, Paige Beckers, Cameron Brink, like so many stars mm -hmm. have come out of this year's NCAA Women's Championship. And it's really incredible. It's really exciting to see. I didn't expect such a massive movement this year. I definitely expected some kind of an increase, but it's definitely exceeded my expectations. How have you felt watching NCAA basketball this year? It's been so cool. I think the best part is like when you mention all those names, there isn't, it wasn't like there was just one root forable star this year. And right. I think that's what made it really tough to be like, Oh, do I want Iowa to win? Cause I want Caitlin Clark to get one of these. But then like, the like South Carolina and like Don Staley's story is incredible. And like mm -hmm. all the athletes that like her just being able to turn that team around, you know, losing all like losing your starting lineup. Mm -hmm. Um, every like LSU, obviously, minus Kim Mulkey, like what a, yeah. <laughs> what a what a cool group of people, yeah. Uh, and it, it just like went like that, like down and down and down, you know, like it, there's everyone there's like such a surplus of people to root for and teams to like get to know and understand. And I think storylines were obviously such a huge thing that we got to see was like such a difference, right. In the women's tournament to the men's this year, um, a little last year too, but you know, you had the wonderful carryover of like the LSU Iowa rematch and everything like that. So I mm -hmm. think that was the most interesting part, not to be cliche, 
as the writer. But I think that was the most interesting part to me was just seeing people pick up on those storylines and get really involved because of it and find their own sort of rooting interests. And I don't know, I, I thought, like, to, to be totally honest, I had more fun. I turned like the men's final game off after the first quarter, I went to sleep. Yeah, it was, um, a, it was a blowout. It was a blowout. I was real tired. Um, <laughs> and I just like didn't really feel compelled. Whereas like for the women's tournament, I'd say for like the last at least six, maybe more matches, I was really like, I got to know what happens, you know? Yeah. It just felt like much more interesting and competitive basketball to me. Um, and I feel like it was that way across the board for a lot of people, whether tuning in for the first time or kind of getting into it this year. Um, again, storylines are a lot of it, but I also wonder why, because it just feels like this year is to your point felt primed. Like mm -hmm. everyone felt really primed to watch it. I wonder if a little bit of that was like FOMO of people missing out last year. And it's like, Oh, I've heard all about this, like mm -hmm. since it happened. And now I got to see for myself, you know, um, because I, to my mind, I don't think like the women's tournament did an, an any better job of like selling themselves, you know, like selling it or promoting than the men's tournament did. I feel like NCAA finally has put those two under the same umbrella. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like there was also just like also way more celebs at the <laughs> at the women's game. Stupid Jason Sudeikis always there. Yeah, yeah. And Maybe like Travis was Scott was randomly in Iowa. That was cool. For a game. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but just like, you know, there's like a there's a real investment of interest uh, and stakes. And I think that was really cool. But yeah, to my mind, it's like the biggest it has been. Yeah. I mean, I completely agree. Like I feel like in years past, I'm not, I have not been an NCAA fan in general. Um, just cause I was like, I don't like the way they treat their mm -hmm. players and I don't, you know, I don't have any like nostalgic or geographic connection to this. So why am I invested? But this year was different because it was really exciting. And, you know, rooting for Caitlin Clark was awesome. And I felt myself rooting for her because I'm like, I'm just rooting for greatness. And I just really like watching greatness. It's just one of the reasons why I love sports. Mm -hmm. But then during that finals game, it kind of hit me. I was like, I think it might low key be better for women's basketball for South Carolina to win this because people who are like complete casuals tuning into this will realize like women's basketball is good. And it's not just Caitlin Clark playing That's a, good with point. a yeah. bunch of people who are like inferior to her. You know what I mean? It's like, no, she actually has like real competition mm -hmm. and there's multiple stars in this. And I think the whole competition was really good for women's basketball overall and the fact that, like, Caitlin Clark had such a magnet to her that it drew so much attention on all these other players as a result of that, I think was, like, a really cool sort of benefit. Mm -hmm. um, and, he, and, you know, they are extremely talented and well-deserving. And going into this year's WNBA draft, it's going to be a historic draft, right? Because everybody is really good. And it's neat to see this like whole generation of players come up at the same time. But I almost feel like it was a little bit grassroots in a way, mm -hmm. like everybody else on social media was talking about it. And then ESPN was like, we should do a segment on this. Oh, yeah. You know sure. what I mean? Like it wasn't the other way around. It wasn't like, come on, guys, we got to push this. It was like people were pushing it and then they followed. Mm -hmm. I think that's also always been my um trepidation is not the right word but i whenever i sort of enter those spaces whether it's like commentary or writing about them or like you know going to these games in person i'm aware of the 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 writers and i was like the athletes i'm of course aware of the athletes but i'm aware of the media who was there well before you know and has been mm. covering this this side of it for who knows how long and oftentimes i'm sure it feels like just purely out of passion and into it like covering sports in general writing in general can often feel just like you're going out into an echo chamber or you're like, is anyone even seeing this? Yeah. And I think for so long, the, the store, like the response to, to women's basketball and to women's sports is like, well, no, the interest isn't there. And it, you kind of saw like, no, I think the interest has always been there, but it's the accessibility and the like availability to watch it. And once you provide people with that, it changes it immensely. Then people want to be like, Oh, I want to know way more about all of these young women. Um, yeah, but to my original point, like 
I'm always like, eh, I'm not trying to step on any toes. I'm not trying to say like, no one's ever covered this because it's the same thing. It's like, I think a lot of people who are like, we've been talking about this. We've talked about this for a long time. We've been involved in it for a long time. And now ESPN decides it can be, it can seem a little bit callous because I'm sure ESPN oh. is like, oh, there's probably a lot of money in this, right? Yeah. <laughs> like maybe we should pay attention to it. That's ultimately can be a driver, but you got to strike a balance there somewhere. And I think, um, I do think that happened this year, but yeah, it was due in huge part to the fact that there's been such a robust community around women's basketball for such a long time. Yeah. And, and, you know, something I think about as, you know, as a Toronto resident and, uh, you know, somebody who's been rooting for women's bas basketball for quite some time and rooting for a team to be in Toronto, you know, it makes me think about how, like, how we were in those expansion conversations and then they mm -hmm. fall through Golden, you know, Go San Francisco slash Golden State ends up being the city that gets a team in 2025. And, like, they're going to have Paige Beckers mm -hmm. or Juju Watkins. More, most likely Paige Beckers, but you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. on their team. And it's like, that is a franchise altering player. Mm -hmm. What a missed opportunity. You know what I mean? Like that, no, like really like from like, I know it's I'm true. Super, I'm super Toronto biased and that's, <laughs> you know, what this podcast is mm -hmm. and that's like, you know, that's fine. But like, man, imagine if Rogers, you know, Ted, Ed, whatever their names are. Ted at all. They're all like, a, they all end in an Ted, AD. Ed, yeah. Fred, yeah. Ed. Yeah whatever right like if those guys had their shit together and weren't so like i don't like i truly don't even know why they didn't choose to invest like no wonder why larry tannenbaum is like broken away from them and tried to do this on his own i don't think larry tannenbaum's a feminist i'm sure he's just a regular capitalist you know but <laughs> even he realized that that was dumb uh <laughs> right and it's like man we could have had Paige Beckers mm -hmm. in Toronto, you know, and or Juju Watkins in Toronto. Like, come on. What a huge missed opportunity to not capitalize on this Magic Johnson slash Larry Bird type generation altering, you know, group for mm -hmm. this sport. Mm -hmm. It's unreal to me. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'll I'll have to mourn that and accept it on my own terms and hopefully you know we get a team one day and we have a, a great star that joins us eventually but yeah i, I mean it, it's wonderful to see i'm really excited regardless of whether toronto has a team or not um it's kind of feels like a dream come true honestly i mean I, not to age myself even though i do every episode you know like i've been <laughs> rooting for this for a really long time you know yeah and yeah. uh, it, it is really cool to finally see it happen. I think I do think the um, intent and like a certain level of seriousness behind that intent is there. I don't think Teresa Rich would have left Toronto. You know what I mean? Without mm. some assurance that she was leaving a pretty good job. That's right. <laughs> you know? um, unless, yeah, she, they, she I don't want to say sure thing, but my understanding and from what I've heard is like, yeah, it's, there's some real money involved and there's like real push involved um, to get that to happen here. Because I think a lot of the people who are involved with it realized it was a missed opportunity and like saw the growth. I also think that there's like this, um, I mean, this isn't just Canadian business or Canadian sports business, but there's this fear of the unknown, right? And mm -hmm. you see this all the time in life too it's like people are really afraid to try something new because it's like not proven yet where then it's like you wait x amount of time not very long in this case with the w like the rise of wba and women's basketball and you're like oh yeah that's really not a gamble at all <laughs> if anything yeah. like it's an incredibly sure thing um so i'm a bit like why wouldn't you jump at the chance of filling up your arena yeah, you know, especially uh, today. Like, it's definitely more of a sure thing today or in the last, yeah. you know, three to four years yeah. than it has been in the past. Like, I mean, oh, I understand sure. why there was reservations in the past, but it's been a sure thing for, for a number of years now. Yeah. Now it's just like, what do we got going on in the summer? The Blue Jays are at a different arena. If you're thinking of doing this at mm -hmm. Scotiabank and maybe you're not going to sell up the upper bowl, that's fine. You're going to just do the lower. Like, are you really just like, well, we got to compete with Bruce Springsteen? No offense to the boss, 
but like, <laughs> or like whoever's like coming to town. I don't know. Bruce Springsteen is a bad example because that's a great show. But <laughs> and he would probably be at the Roger Center. True, true. I um, but I'm just like yeah. if if their argument is like, well, we can't forfeit all of like these phenomenal concert bookings we have throughout the summer. I don't really think that's holds up. So uh, it doesn't hold up, and that's a great point. And I I I angry tweeted when this came out, which I don't often do, but I angry tweeted this day because what I did was I went to the Scotiabank Arena website nice, and I went to their calendar and I took screenshots of their summer calendar. Receipts. And it was empty. <laughs> it was legit empty. Scotiabank Arena is empty in the mm. summer. They only had two to three events, not just concerts, events. Pathetic. In July and August. So they could absolutely accommodate a WNBA team may was a little tricky but not the second half of may mm -hmm. which is when the WNBA season starts mm -hmm. and september was a little tricky but again it would be the first half of september and then beyond that i mean if you're still playing you're basically deep into the playoffs and the finals so you're gonna sell more and make more anyways Mm -hmm. I, I mean, just, yeah, it, the whole calendar Scotiabank Arena competing thing was uh, a complete joke. And also, like, this city has multiple venues. Yeah, exactly. And it's not like the Raptors are at a point where they're competitively good enough that we're like, they're going to be making a deep playoff run in the next two years. Like, right. that's not relevant. So they're not going to be on the calendar. And I've, like, written about the guys who make the NBA calendars. Like, they could adjust. They have the craziest programs that they use to like sort. That oh stuff yeah, out. they're fine. They do, and there was an there was an incident last year, where was it last year? The Atlanta Hawks had a playoff game, and Janet Jackson. This is why I remember this. Oh yeah, I do. Had a concert that. in Atlanta. <laughs> and on the day of the playoff game, and they figured. I don't remember how they resolved it, but they figured it out. They figured it out. Yeah, and that's oh, it's like not like it can't be done. No, have a have a matinee game, and then you have another game at night. There you go, easy. Yeah. Anyway, the whole thing's ridiculous. Stupid, stupid Rogers. Unless you want to, unless you want to sponsor this podcast, Rogers. Yeah, Rogers. Unless you want to pony up and bring all of our cell phone plans down to by like forty dollars where they were, maybe even more by fifty dollars. Yeah. Why just, is it so expensive to have a phone? Just Everyone like the has rest a of the world. Now. Yeah. And internet. You guys have a monopoly. You should be ashamed of yourself. And might. stop calling me every day. Boom. You know what? Yes. I'm not even with you anymore. Stop calling me every day. I'm with the <laughs> other is, terrible conglomerate. Rogers slander punk. It's fine. <laughs> um, I'm with Fido, which is okay. like derivative of Rogers. Mm. It was cheaper for a while, but now not anymore. Yeah. My internet's with Bell. It's very expensive. Just my internet. Yeah. Bell sucks too. No one is good. No one's good. No one's good. Anyway, I could, I could, I could have really gone on. I had to stop myself because I was like, I could. We love, I mean, if there's one thing we love, and I'll get on with this one, like uh, American friends ask me about like the WBA, like team situation, team ownership situation of the Raptors. It's just like, it always goes up to the top. It always goes up to Rogers. And then I'm just going off. And they're like, I didn't ask about Canada's telecommunications dynasty. Yeah. Well, well, in it, a way it, you did. It, it's kind of like politics in that they just have so much power. Yes. That they deserve to be taken down a peg. Yeah. Sorry, I'm getting one of my strepsils. Oh, I was like, are you typing? This is, this You're is like my strepsils. I realize there's like a bit of an aluminum audio. I thought you were... Like sending a really urgent email. This is these are the ones I'm using right now. Oh yeah, I'm familiar. I have some of those in my cabinet right now. There you go. Strepsils. Shout it out. Shout out strepsils if you want us. Get that strepsils <laughs> money. I'm just attempting to be more business savvy. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Let's uh let's move on. There's another topic I want to get into, uh, MBA wise. And uh I stumbled upon this article from Bleacher Report that was sort of evaluating the different trades that had been made uh, mm -hmm. over this last season. And I thought this was a really good idea because 
we always talk about like this team needs to make a move that need team needs to make a move blah 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 and then we don't really often look back to be like how did that actually go for that team and you know i think the clear runaway winner is the boston celtics not that i like the boston celtics mm-hmm. um i think watching this year's playoffs is going to low key kind of suck because <laughs> They're going to steamroll into the finals, it looks like. I don't think so. Oh, yes. Okay, yeah. good. I need to hear that because I don't want that to happen, but it feels like it's going to happen. But, you know, the addition of Drew Holiday, which is talked about a lot, but also Porzingis has really taken this team to another level here. They are, I believe, in the NBA standings, 15 games ahead of the second place team. Let me confirm that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 62 wins, and then the Milwaukee Bucks have 49 wins. I mean, that says a lot about them, but it also says a lot about the Eastern Conference. (laughs) Which is why I don't think they're going to just steamroll their way there. I think there's so much instability in the East right now that it also, like, instability doesn't make it just easier for good teams to get what they want easily. It makes it so there's like worse teams or technically worse teams that are going to come in and be like, "Hmm, we're going to actually, you know, give you a, give you like a couple tough games here. Like I think about Mm. the heat and the Celtics, you know, I just like, there are teams, there are teams in the East right now, very capable of getting under Boston's skin, which is to me why they've lost. I'm kind of of two minds about it. One, I think the, all the reasons that they've lost in the past haven't necessarily been fixed by the addition of Porzingis Maybe more Drew Holiday, but I also just respect him more as a person and a player. Yes, and um, but I think that this this tendency they have to really get flustered by their almost their own like technicality. Like they mm. were like, we're a perfect basketball team, but then the minute you kind of come in and are like agitate them, mm. they try very hard to just stick to the plan. They're not very good at adjusting in that sense and i think it also really has rattled them in the past so um they don't have a sense of humor is what i'm saying and sometimes you need you need just to be able to like look at things from a different perspective and they're not very good at that i would say like missoula as a coach has gotten better but that's a really tough thing to instill in a team that didn't really have that to begin with yeah. Um, mm-hmm. My other mm-hmm. my other comparison which isn't going to make you feel any better but when i think about why they might likely win is I actually compare them to Toronto Mm. when we had heartbreak after heartbreak uh, in the playoffs, similar to Boston, like almost getting there, almost getting there, almost getting there, losing for just the worst reasons. And when you knock at the door that many times, there is a point when you're either like, okay, are we going to kick this door in or are we going to stop trying to do this? So uh, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Uh, For the late, for the reason you just said is why I think Boston's right there. Okay. Um, in addition to the moves that they've made in this off season, but I also completely agree with you when it comes to Joe Missoula, (laughs) this is like not a politically correct take. There's just something about this guy. There's something about his eyes. You know what I mean? Like, have you seen this guy talk? Yeah. Like, I don't think he blinks. (laughs) He's intense. There's certain like I don't intensity. know. Like you know what I mean. Like I'm sorry. Like I shouldn't like make critiques about people's like physical appearance or anything. Like I, but but like there's just something about this guy. There's a he level of not, intensity. He doesn't blink. Like yeah. I don't like. It's just it's so weird to me. And like if you watch like his interviews last year in the playoffs, I'm mm. like, he is. I don't know, man. There's I just think something about him. Last year, he was a little bit out of his depth, and I think for that was sure he probably was. like yeah. you were just see- he wasn't blinking because he was playing certain aspects of his life over his eyes like a projector <laughs> <laughs> from inside of his brain, and like we've all been like there. the freaking like the carousel and Mad Men. Like, yes, just- <laughs> we've all been there. Jo- um, this year, I mean, it's like I don't know. He's like he's made some jokes in post games. I feel like he's he understands a little bit better the team than he has Mm. and the things they need to do. Um, I think it's just like the, I've also like, I've come around on Tatum. I've always liked Jalen Brown. I like, I get, I get the Celtics, but the main reasons why I doubt them are still largely intact. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wonder if they aren't maybe in for a little bit of a shakeup, like perfect basketball does not do well in the playoffs. You know what I mean? Like, 
you can't win that way. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, obviously, like, if if they make it to the finals and they go up against Denver, I mean, respect, you know, Porzingis versus Jokic, I mean, I don't know. If I, I, would only, that, I would like to see that happen if only for that matchup and for Jokic to really just destroy him the way we it. feel he deserves yeah. to be destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and in such a, a way that feels careless and second you know like a second nature just like eh, yeah it was nothing do you feel like there were any other teams this past year that made a move that you feel will really make a difference in the playoffs or you feel has actually like hindered their team mm -hmm. no i'm cycling through i mean the the bucks are an interesting thought and real basketball experiment experiment yeah not I really mean, sure I, I i have said on i i believe i've said on this podcast before um the bucks could have a fourth coach on their salary yeah like imagine because <laughs> who would i mean like maybe they keep doc rivers because they don't have a choice but Doc is sending everyone these basically like ransom notes for himself. He's like, get me out of here, please. I never asked for this. Throwing the poor equipment manager under the bus. That, that poor equipment manager that has been thrown under the bus multiple times. I know. I'm kind of like, I want to know more about this person. Are they like chaotic or is it just, are they so yeah. good at their jobs? Is, people are like resentful of them. Katie, this is why you and I need to move up in the world because <laughs> we would be getting that interview. Yeah, I will. You know what I, I mean? Want, I don't want Doc. I don't want Giannis. God damn. Get me the equipment manager. Yeah. yeah. He's the one we want on the podium. Yeah. I know. I know. You know? In the hot and I, seat. And I, and I hope that if he did get fired, God forbid, that the exposure would lead him to a better opportunity. That's a podcast. We know there's a lot of player podcasts now. That is like a player adjacent podcast I would actually want to listen to. Absolutely. Those that is all that the is the interview. Yeah, I because see what they're doing. I see they have to pack in the, the they pack the strip holes. They're packing <laughs> the Kleenex. They're packing the they're pa like the things that they have and they're like and the packing like people who love like watch packing videos to calm down. Yeah, would love yeah. to just walk by uh, an NBA locker room when the equipment manager is unpacking all their little mm. bo road boxes. Yeah, I'm telling you. That would be um that would be a solid TikTok account. Oh. <laughs> but like like I don't even know what he means by like they're not professional. Yeah. Like how unprofessional could they be that you're losing games? Like you don't have fresh underwear? Like what's happening? Yeah, you're like not getting them the shoes that they need. Yeah, like no. How is that how is that possible? I would argue that would also make to some degree the athlete the unprofessional one. Cause it's like, you can't just for one game, like, sorry, you didn't get, sorry. It's a different underwear. <laughs> I, anyway. Um, I'm you trying should to think be of, able to play in all types of underwear. Play free. Play without it. <laughs> I'm trying to think of actual other legitimate uh, moves that happened. Well, mm. I mean, I, well, I will say that it is very puzzling and 30 for 30 doc worthy that Damian Lillard to the Bucks didn't result in them being a significantly better team. The thing that I waffle on is they weren't at least to start the season when a lot of that was, that was like the common line. They really weren't that bad. They were still, you know what I mean? Like they were still winning. They're still going to be in the playoffs. So I think like that certainly depends on like what your idea of bad basketball is. Like obviously Raptors fans are in the trenches, so it's different. Or like, I would love that in crazy basketball team to be my basketball team. I'd love to be hearing my coach yell about the equipment oh. manager. But um, the decline has been more interesting because it feels to me like things are actually splintering more um, where now they should be coming together. Um, yes. And like defensively also, that's not a huge surprise because like Dame's never been the biggest fan of playing defense. Giannis as well. Like so, and you lost some of that support in trying to make space for the way that Dame plays the game. So, and I think the coaching disruption did not help them either. So no. I technically understand why they're so down in the dumps, but like um, vibe wise, I don't. Yeah, I don't. Yes, I completely agree. Like they're second in the East. 
They yeah. have 49 wins. They will likely be a 50 win team before the season's over. Why are their vibes so bad? Terrible. Like, I yeah, like that. I, I don't get why their vibes are so bad because they are. I mean, except for that week where they were losing against the worst teams in the league. Um, yeah, like they should like on paper, they should be a good vibes team. So, you know, I wonder if like that franchise looks back and regrets the Damian Lillard trade, mm-hmm. you know, do they still wish they had you holiday and they could undo that whole thing? Or like, I, I don't know. I don't but, think they should have fired, Bud. can, if he's still on the payroll, can he just come back? Is he? But I mean, getting fired and then being like, actually, can you come back to your job like a year later is pretty wild. I felt like. Test the water. See what he's they, up to. They should have given Bud a, a leave of absence mm-hmm. and not a firing. Right. Because like, I mean, he lost his brother suddenly and that's yeah. awful. Yeah. You know, so it's like, give him some time. He did win you a championship. Like. You know, granted, like, you know, Kevin Durant's toe on the line, et cetera. But still, like, you want a championship with that guy to fire him so quickly. I agree. I thought that was completely uh, egregious and also regrettable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I feel like their championship hasn't led to the good vibes you expect a championship to leave a team with. Mm-hmm. Um, Yeah, I think all that's very interesting. Mm-hmm. And I'm not quite sure what to make of it just yet, but we'll see. I think the playoffs will be very telling for us. Yeah. Um, I, think, I yeah, guess the Clippers are another one just quickly. Like I, hmm. I'm so intrigued by the Clippers and I have to think of like, is it just because I love an aging star trying to make good? And this is basically just like almost a retirement villa as a team. And I love it so much. And you know I'm also uh, like the biggest Westbrook supporter. And I actually legitimately think it's so interesting. And I just wrote a story about this. You can read it at SV. Um, But it is so interesting to me that Russ went from being like kryptonite for some reason to the Lakers. They're like, this guy's Mm -hmm. unplayable. He'll Mm -hmm. do anything for us, whatever. Right to the Clippers. Same arena. Didn't have to move. (laughs) Um, and now he's just like, he's indispensable. Like we're trash without him. The slump that the Clippers had. That's really so true. Neatly tied in with Russ being out because he broke his hand. Same thing has happened to Scotty Barnes. Unlike Scotty Barnes, Russ is just back being like a crazy whirlwind, having like his first start since November and just like breaking NBA records. You know, so I think he had his 199th triple double mm-hmm. a couple days ago That's against incredible. the Suns. Yeah, like, you know, I get it. Russell Westbrook is certainly a of barometer. Of course, against the Suns. Yeah. He had to, he had to let Kevin Durant know. Always. I, I wish he was wearing the photographer. No, wait. No, yeah. I, it, I was like, did Russ do that to KD or KD do it to Russ? I wish he was wearing the official photographer vest when he did that. Um, oh, my God. But I'll just say, like, Kawhi's looked great. Um Paul George sometimes looks like he's drifting around in space, but he's also looked really great. Russ has been amazing. Even James Harden is like, who can't be consistent to save his life, you know, mm-hmm. has looked in bursts like a really phenomenal producer is like fitting in very well with the energy. And, and I don't know. I mean, I, it feels cursed to be like, a, I want a Steve Ballmer team to win anything. But I like that team, the parts of that team more than the sum of its owner. So it would be wildly significant for all their careers. Yes. To win a championship or even yeah. just to make the finals. Yeah. Honestly. That's kind of what I want them to do. Cause like that's a place the the Clippers have never been able to get to, notably mm-hmm. under Doc Rivers, um, mm-hmm. Lob City Clippers. But yeah, I, I think like that trade that any no one thought, like no one thought. Everyone, anyone, everyone thought it was like, a bad trade. That's yeah. absolutely true. Or anyone who picked up hard and it was like, you were shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, but it's worked for them. Yeah, I probably also thought it was a bad trade uh, at the time, honestly. And, you know, it, like you said, it was it was really because of Westbrook that that trade ended up working out. Mm-hmm. Right? Because he was like, okay, I will go to the bench. And I think a large part of that, too, was like they saw how it worked and didn't work in Houston together. Mm-hmm. So it was like they already had that experience to kind of learn from. And I think that's in part why Westbrook was like, fine, I'll mm-hmm. I'll go to the 
bench, but I would argue that he is a more integral and vital part to their team. Absolutely. Whether he starts or doesn't, then James Harden at this point, which is also oh. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. He's basically just made room for James Harden. It's like, James, can you come in and just please like get some shots off? Um, and we'll do the rest. You know, it's mm -hmm. like we'll do the heavy lifting. You come in and just kind of produce. Mm -hmm. And that would be great. <laughs> yeah. And I guess like, you know, James Harden at this stage in his career is benefiting from everyone else around him mm -hmm. also just being very good that they can kind of make up for his lapses and mm -hmm. then if he has a game where he's on point and has a hot hand then they can adjust and benefit from that so mm -hmm. yeah i'm really curious to see what they'll be like in the playoffs i didn't see this game where phoenix only had like six points and the clippers had like 30 something yeah that was <laughs> nuts i was like what on earth um yeah, I'd be curious to see if those teams uh, face off the playoffs. Another potentially regrettable trade is Bradley Beal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder, sometimes I wonder about that just because of the slow start um, that he had there. And just like the team's sort of injury struggles, like you can't yeah. really, I don't know. I don't, I don't think Frank Vogel's doing a terrible job. I don't think that team is bad on paper but it's another one of those situations where you're like well why are they this bad given yeah. given who they're who they've got because to me kevin duran always just seems like someone he's just like i just want to play basketball please yes it's like that's all, that's what i've wanted for seasons now yeah just let me do it and it's kind of like you get out of his way okay so and i feel like that's what the Suns have really largely tried to do but um yeah i don't know it hasn't worked out too well yeah, and I believe, you know, based on the Bradley Beal trade that they've kind of put themselves like in a hole where like they don't have an, much room to do anything significant beyond what they have. Like, I mm -hmm. feel like uh, I haven't researched that thoroughly, but from what I hear, I feel like they're kind of they're stuck in this position. So they kind of have to make it work. And like, mm -hmm. I kind of thought to myself, like, man, like if Frank Vogel gets fired again. It would be like his second, in my opinion, like very unfair firing. Absolutely. You know, Unlike because... these high profile, not very stable teams. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, let's move on and uh, look at, I want to look at the play in races with you specifically. Uh, leading this is up so complicated. If you it's, can make sense of the math, please. It's so <laughs> Okay, uh, so I have two thoughts on this. One, which I've said on this podcast before, we have to abolish the conferences. This is ridiculous. <laughs> the bottom half of the Eastern Conference is barely worth watching compared to the bottom part of the Western Conference when yeah. it comes to this play. -in. Oh, yeah. I mean, come on. Like, it's just enough already. But uh, look, Trey Young is back. Apparently, he looks good. Um, and that could make for uh, a fun first round. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think the Bulls are going anywhere. Um, but those two are locked in that 9-10. And, mm -hmm. you know, are we tuning into that or not? The Sixers have won six in a row. They are one game back behind the Pacers for six. Mm -hmm. uh, this, the Pacers, however, have won their last three in a row. So the Pacers would have to lose um, for the Sixers to jump out of the play in, but they're definitely trying. And I got to say, like, obviously I think the Sixers are going to be here, whether they're sixth, seventh or eighth. I very much believe they can get out of the first round mm -hmm. if they have the right matchup, especially if they end up in a three, six matchup, which is the Knicks. Right. Um, I also think the Bucks, like we've talked about, are spiraling. And I do think a healthy 76ers team could beat the Bucks and be a massive spoiler there. Um, if they face the Celtics in the first round, that would be uh, very unfortunate for the 76ers. The Heat are currently in eighth. And I think that is where they will end up. Mm -hmm. uh, a Boston Heat round one matchup does excite me i hope jimmy butler is healthy because he hasn't been playing much as of late mm -hmm. but i i don't follow the heat enough respectfully 
uh, to know what to Amy actually. Jaime Hack was just an hour ago. <laughs> is he back? Not about Jimmy. Out? Not about Jimmy. Jaime is back. Okay. Jimmy, I wonder if that's just them playing it safe. Because don't you remember about last year's um last year's playoffs? It was like Jim, oh, Jimmy's hurt, and then he just played like he did, and they made mm. it all the way to the finals. And then it like by the end, they're like, Oh yeah, Jimmy's finger was hanging on by a thread and his knee was broken. And not yeah, really, but it's like really, that's what yeah, like, the yeah. injury report was. <laughs> so yeah, just he's, that that he's got big, an uncanny ability to play through it. That big coffee really uh really keeps his engine running yeah but um yeah i mean i think this is a very uh exciting race except for nine and ten because really who cares i would be shocked if the hawks uh spoiled the heat or the 76ers but at least it will make that play in game more entertaining with trey young in mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. that's the most i can really say for that it's tough because the hawks i feel like have been here for so many years and i'm kind of like I don't believe in you at this point. And I also yeah. question your ability. I don't mean to be like whether you want it, because I that is such like an abstract thing, mm. but there is such a trepidation in the Hawks that I can't really place any other way, you know? Um, like obviously Trey can lock in and you know put up tons of shots in a game but then he'll just sort of vanish the next so i'm also not really i kind of have forgotten about the hawks all season and i'm sure i will again in the playoffs the sixers <laughs> thing is tough to me because uh i now have to root for the sixers because of kyle lowry i know and buddy healed and okay. tyrese maxi mm -hmm. it's unfortunately quite a likable team mm -hmm. um and i'm they are also in a similar situation to the Celtics and that they've like almost been there so many times, though they have been farther away mm. than the Celtics so many times. Um, I'm also like, well, Nick Nurse get Nick Nurse won't get fired if they fall out early again. No, He's got another year. I'm sure. I think he has another year. Definitely. Yeah. But also I think, you know, with Nick Nurse, it's like, he doesn't necessarily have to win a championship. He just has to get out of the second round. Yeah, exactly. You know, in That's his tenure test. with that team. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, okay. So wait, a few things there. So a lot of people have been saying that the Hawks are going to trade DeJounte Murray or Trey Young, that they're going to move off of one of those players. Yeah. The one thing I haven't heard anybody talk about with the Hawks, which I find really confusing is why haven't they been able to build around Trey Young? Like, why weren't they in, like, the Rudy Gobert sweepstakes when he mm -hmm. was getting traded from Utah or something like that? Because to me, Trey Young, it's like, okay, he's a, po he's a point guard. He's, you know, he's a bit of a ball hog, but he's, you know, pretty elite offensively, you know, and he's a liability defensively. Okay, <laughs> why wouldn't you try to find like a Rudy Gobert mm -hmm. to put around him mm -hmm. to make up for that? Like, it wouldn't that be the move? Like, I, I don't understand their, why I don't understand the DeJounte Murray move, but I also don't understand literally any move that they've made since that Eastern conference finals run that they had. Like, I don't get why they weren't able to capitalize off of that. And I guess I don't watch enough, hawks basketball to fully dive into that but i haven't heard any national nba pundit explain that either and i just mm -hmm. think that's the huge mystery to me i think they've already tried to trade De dejounte murray and they couldn't and i think that's the only reason why they're going to trade trey young but considering they traded luca for trey young <laughs> what a massive l for that whole franchise i mean at what point do you just fire the front office? Yeah, that's you a know? good point. I mean, they made one correct decision. They did hire Quinn Snyder. Yeah. Um, so I would be lying. I have paid attention to Quinn Snyder, Quinn Snyder's post games um, and interviews, but I haven't really paid attention to Hawks basketball. Um, that that's much. funny. That's I how much of an NBA sicko you are that you have watched Quinn Snyder's post game interviews and not the Is game. that sicko behavior? Look, I'm I like a so. Quinn. Like I'm a I'm a hot blooded so. woman. I see Quinn in those glasses. And those are my glasses. 
And that California accent, he has a very California accent. Yeah. He, we were talking about like intensity earlier because like there are sometimes when Quinn Snyder doesn't blink, but he balances it out with the California. Yeah, he does. The he California does. vibes. Yeah. yeah, he does. Um, and he gives you a, I might be a normal, smart person. Yeah. Vibe. Yeah, for sure. Uh, DeJounte Murray, actually, I should also say to be fair, has been playing incredibly. And if I was the front office, just like at a glance in terms of like what Trey Young has yielded. And I do hate talking about people like this, but mm. um, I would be more apt to say like, you know what? We tried our best with Trey and whether they did or not, I have no idea. Um, we're going to move off of Trey would obviously get us more back in return. And like, let's go with the person who is really seems to want to be here um, has stepped into like kind of an entire new echelon of his game. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, also seems like pretty humble like pretty normal, like good sense of humor guy. I don't know. The Rudy Gobert thing is interesting. I was just thinking of like how high strung that locker room would be. Oh yeah. I don't (laughs) think personality wise, they would be a good fit. Yeah. But, uh, but just in terms of like their game, like it's a good point. Like why didn't you, why haven't you brought in a big like that? Yeah. Like that's what they've needed. A stopper. Yeah. Cause I mean like Clint Capella is like, you know, okay, but he's not, I don't know. He's not who you need him to be for this team to go far. And then that's mm-hmm. also why they traded Collins away. And it's just, I just don't understand what they've been doing or trying to do. I don't think they do either, to be fair. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to cough. Okay. <laughs> wow. That was okay. a big one. That was a big one. Okay, oh, strepsils no. again. Strepsils. Uh, all right, 40, 46, 40. Let uh, let Daniel know. <laughs> Shout out to Daniel who helps me with this podcast. Um, all right, <laughs> we gotta move on. Let's move on to uh our Raptors Homer moment. Okay. Uh, Katie, we we broke our losing streak. Yeah, we did. We won two in a row. Yeah, and Huge. everybody started getting pizza fever again. <laughs> And then we lost to the Pacers and, you know, I, I, I hope Raptors fans are just eating pizza regardless at this point. Um, but at least they gave us something to tune into, uh, towards the end of this season. Um, my question for you is, do you feel there is something either Raptors fans or the team itself can take away from this last uh, attempt at positivity, if you will, uh, heading into the end of this season? I think so. One, I think it's a great feeling to put something that hasn't been the most, you know, beneficial behind you. Like they've had a really hard season. And I've said this before in terms of just like, not just how many, you know, they've had like 29 people on this roster, not just in terms of, you know, the makeup of the team, but things that people on the team have gone through, um, you know, like tragic loss and also mm-hmm. just like some off court drama, which, you know, we're going to talk about, but like yeah. there's been a, it's a lot, like it is a lot and it's a lot for a predominantly young team. So those are times when I'm like very thankful for somebody like Garrett Temple in that locker room, Kelly yes. Olenek now in that locker room, Bruce Brown too, to just be able to be like, it, this isn't normal. Yeah, because can literally. you imagine you're Grady Dick and you're like, this, this is the NBA, like, this yeah, is my first year. like this is not, this is an anomaly season, so don't worry about it. Yeah, and it's also with a whole other group of people than yeah. from what it started with. Yeah, but like, I you're, like watching uh, the Nets game, like fucking Dennis Schroeder revenge game. I forgot he was on this team. People love a good revenge game again. He was really in, he was really yeah. into the revenge game and I was like I forgot you were I here. forgot he, I've forgotten multiple times that he was on the team this season and I think he no, not me personally but I think he understands it. I guess his kids never forgot based on that birthday that late birthday cake. Did you oh see that? <laughs> yes. I, I was like, how can you not get another cake? Like I don't understand how I mean it was it an is. elaborate cake, but I guess it's like if you don't want to you don't want to just get a I'm like, you could just get a grocery store cake, but I guess they didn't want to. Okay, first of all, yes, you could just get a grocery store cake. Number two, 
You have so much money. True. I'm like, oh, they probably spent a lot of money on the cake. So like, they were like, can we return this? Like, you just have to roll. You Look, all you have, to, first of all, the cake is solid. You just got to roll out some fondant. Yeah. And make it the nuts instead of the raptors. It's not even like you have to bake a whole new cake. You just need That's a different point. accoutrements. Yeah. Call a bakery and be like, I don't even need you to make a cake. I mean, it can't be, roll it can't be that hard. For me. Yeah. Some you fondant, roll out some the nice fondant. rosettes, do a little yeah. new airbrushing. Yeah. Yeah. Some airbrushing. I know. Some basketballs. Like, come on. Fair. Fair. Um, I'm anyway. like, well, the economics of the cake. Anyway. <laughs> the- I'm just like lashing out all my baking the- knowledge now. Okay. Anyway. I don't know. The, I think like the, the biggest silver lining for me of the season, it has to just be like leaning into the absurdity of it and the, at times extremely low points of it for the players on the team. I mean, um, and to recognize what I said before is like, it's, this is not normal. You know, um, there's a certain amount of resiliency that's built up in that. Yeah. You've also seen because of the fact that like so many people are hurt right now, we've gotten some pretty phenomenal like G league minutes and Mm -hmm. those aren't nothing, you know, especially to those guys, like those aren't nothing, whether they stay with the team or not, which I hope someone like Javon Freeman Liberty does, you know, like I hope they're able to stay. Um, Muhammad Gay, like I've really loved watching him. So it's like, you, you see these sort of flashes and flourishes we wouldn't have otherwise. And I think that's a really positive thing. And, you know, to Grady Dick, like he's been, he's like really stepped into some of this like questionable he's he's been able to like kind of put the chaos out of his head michael grange did have a really good profile about him um this week and he talks a lot about the training that he did when he went to the g league and being able to look at it like more of a learning experience and not really focusing on what was going on with the team at the time which was probably a very good thing to do because it's like yeah don't focus on the chaos over there focus on you over here so I think in general, there's like a lot of lessons to it. When we were looking, when we started this season, in my mind, understanding that like Pascal OG um, could have been traded away. Mm-hmm. I think a, like the hope was like maybe the play in. And that obviously went off the table pretty quick when Scotty Barnes got hurt. But that kind of thing is like a very tenable goal for next season. And I think for the oh, where yeah. this team is at developmentally, they're going to make more changes over the summer. I'm very sure of that. Yeah. Um, I think that's a good position to be in. I think you got to, I think I actually will say Raptors fans have done a deep better job than I anticipated of um, managing their expectations of this team. Yeah. 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 Like it's been a bummer to watch, but in every game, there's still like a decent takeaway. Yeah. I, I completely agree. And one thing I'll add to that, especially just in terms of like the Raptors fans and how they've handled this, mm-hmm. I, you know, when some people are like, well, you know, everybody wanted the Raptors to pick a direction and boy, sure. They, you know, they sure did blah, blah, blah. And I'm kind of like, nobody picked this. <laughs> you imagine? No one picked this. Yeah. Like what the last month and or last six weeks have been for the Raptors, <laughs> no one picked this. Like, I don't know why people are still saying that. You know I mean? and Bobby sit down in their journals when they're journaling at night. Like, I really I can't it. wait for Scotty Barnes to break his hand. <laughs> like, just, yeah. I need a betting, I need the NBA's biggest betting scandal to land on one of our <laughs> players. Yeah, like nobody picked this. Nobody did. You know what I mean? Like Like you said, like after those trades happened, like we still had play in hopes. Yeah. Which would have been our hopes before those trades. So, yeah, I mean, maybe some people would argue that they hoped that we'd be a bit better than play in. But I think play in would have been a bit more realistic for our team prior to uh, the OG and Pascal trades. So, yeah, nobody picked this. Nobody asked for this. The, this has been an absolute disaster. And we have the Yakup Purtle trade that everyone hated to thank for hopefully recuperating this top six pick. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you just like you said, you got to you got to appreciate the resilience and hope that that's the takeaway and that it's made everybody stronger and better for for next season. I, I mean, I just I just can't get over that everyone keeps saying that. That's 
extremely funny. <laughs> but no, I think like Emmanuel yeah. quickly has been amazing. RJ Barrett has yeah. been amazing. Like it's been so much fun and it feels so heartening to me to have somebody like Kelly Olynyk on the team and for him to like say how much it means to him. You know what I mean? Like mm. poor Bruce Brown, even myself included, everyone's like, he's gone, he's gone, he's out of here, pushing this guy out the door. Like maybe he does stay. That would be fine. He's a yeah. great athlete. Like they could really use him, you know? Um, yeah. So I think like some of that might just be willing it to happen so it doesn't hurt you when it does. So you can mm. be like, I knew it. Um, but like, yeah, the idea that like this is the direction Joe's. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of love that. I kind of love picturing that yeah. and like the meetings of how that would happen and how difficult, how much harder it is to do this, what has happened, than it is to just win. It's so yeah. much harder to do everything that has just happened. It's so than to just win games. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh my God. Um, all right. <laughs> Katie, let's let's move on. To uh well, I wrote, I guess we have to talk about Jonte Porter, three question marks and a big LOL. What what do we say at this point? I mean um, it, look, it, it hasn't been official, but there was stuff that came out earlier today. Uh as regulars know, we record this on Thursday, it comes out on Friday. Oh, but um, our track record is always like we talk about something and then and then it blows up in our face. Katie, yeah. That's so true. <laughs> it's true. Uh, Okay, well, all right. This this next sentence might be irrelevant as soon as it comes out of my mouth. <laughs> but uh Adam Silver uh has expressed his um dislike of the John Tick Porter situation and has essentially said that an actual NBA ban is on the table, but it has yet to be official. I assume he will be banned from the NBA. Um, I'd be surprised if they were softer on him than that. Mm -hmm. Um, I have retweeted multiple people who have politely pointed out that there are numerous people in this league who have done worse things than gamble, um, who are still in the league. But aside from that, uh, I, I don't know, Kitty, I don't know what you want to say about it. I think to me, the most ridiculous part is um, Adam Silver calling it a cardinal sin because it's like you invented this problem. You didn't oh. invent sports gambling, but you certainly invited it in to take like full control almost of your product. Um, yes, I'm on side, of course, with the people who are like, there's a lot worse and way more um, impactful, personally impactful things done by players in this league, you know, harm, very harmful and life altering things and like making a weird prop bet on yourself. So to me, like, I'll never, <laughs> I'll never be like, yeah, this is the cardinal sin. Like what a weird, what a wild thing to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. To like set so stakes, but like you've set them and you have been setting them kind of all along. Um, when you're like, gambling is the most important thing to us. We need to make money. So probably, yeah, I wouldn't, I would not be surprised if Dante Porter is banned. Um, it is interesting to me to think about this happening, like in the abstract, if, you know. Oh yeah. Like if Jeff you were an all-star. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> like we, I was, we were talking about that. Uh, it wouldn't I think happen. With us. I was like, what yeah. if this were an all-star? Yeah. Yeah, you know, and like it would be how so differently much different would then. he be treated? Yeah, the I frustrating thing to it. me with that is like we've also seen that before, whether it's on the team side or league side, with it being quote easier to take action against athletes who do commit instances of intimate partner violence or any other kind of violent um, crime when they mm -hmm. are not notable athletes. Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. we've like the Raptors have even done this in the past, so. Uh, that's just like something that always I always have like as an asterisk in my head, like this, it, these things are scalable. To my mind, they should not be scalable on the domestic abuse side, of course, but they they're always scalable. The NBA is a private entity. It's a business. Mm -hmm. uh, they can decide how they want to, you know, meet out their version of. What is it? What do you say when you commit when you do when you do sins? Rosary. You've committed a sin. 
Yeah, like what is well if Adam Silver wants to make like call this a cardinal sin, it's like how do you do penance? There pen there we go. Oh, there I, go. I finally arrived. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's just yeah, like I, more... I didn't grow up with religion and nothing was more either. obvious than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't either. <laughs> I just mean like all these things tend to be so cyclical within the NBA. And I think that's what continues to be the most disappointing thing uh, in situations like this cyclical and that they're very predictable. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, I feel like, you know, the moral compass of the NBA is, um, you know, like the magnet is money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right mm -hmm. like it's not uh it's yeah. not a real moral compass and so um i think that's also really frustrating because i think it, it's really obvious um to fans and it gets a bit disheartening and like look like i think john Tay porter deserves to be banned from the league right like I, i'll just straight up say that i think he deserves to be banned from the league i think what he did harms the integrity of the game mm -hmm. in a very significant way and you have to you have to set that standard now, right? So that, like, because if he only gets suspended for a year, then for somebody who's, like, you know, 12th guy on the bench making six figures could figure out a way to prop bet into another six figures, they lose a year. You know what I mean? Like, they're practically out of the league anyway. Mm -hmm. Then why not do that? Mm -hmm. So I think you kind of have to set that standard now and, like, Obviously, that's unfortunate, but he did what he did, and he'll become a, a like a finance bro on. He Discord. already was. He, he already like was, and he of... was exactly like he yeah. already was, and he will be again. Yeah. Like John Tay Porter is gonna be just fine, you know what yeah. I mean? And that's probably his true passion. He's anyway. gonna go on his brother's podcast where his brother says questionable things. Oh my about god, women's, women's basketball. <laughs> Women's basketball, but he also said some very questionable things uh, related to uh, sexual activities of NBA players. Oh, yeah, I forgot about and that. And that went around this week, too. So mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. anyway, that he's he maybe just shouldn't have a podcast at this point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, I think he should be suspended from the league. I just think that, like, maybe a couple other people should also be uh, not in the league. Um, I agree. All right, let's move on to uh our hottie highlight of the week and uh katie i decided uh to give you a choice okay so we had um grady dick addressing the crowd at our final home game Saw that. um which was in my opinion delightfully awkward but i am someone who does public speaking on a regular basis so maybe this sweater the sweater, sweater was an odd choice. He was wearing a mock, a mock neck. It was so sweet. I like. I really like that. I was like, they they picked it, but like, like at this point, it's it's him. Uh yeah. Uh, I had uh Emmanuel quickly uh uncontrollably jumping uh during the Nets game. Mm -hmm. Um, like with too. with deep enthusiasm. And okay, I heard this on the broadcast, but I didn't actually Google it. Did Grady Dick have a career high last night against the Nets? I don't know. In points or in threes? Catherine, I did not watch the game. <laughs> Honestly, fair. Um, I let this audience know that I stopped watching Raptors games, but I did watch the Nets last night in the background while uh, sleeping um, because of my cold. Yeah. That's fair. Okay, so just his performance at okay, so I guess that's not it. So it's Grady Dick addressing the crowd. Okay. Or Emmanuel Quickly's nonstop jump jumping at the Nets game. This is tough. This is a tough decision. The right? hardest one of these you've ever thrown my right, way. See? Now yeah. the audience knows what I go through every week. Yeah. <laughs> Though the Grady Dick uh addressing the crowd was pretty cute. And like I thought how for how awkward it was, he still handled it pretty well. Because that's like a big ask. Yeah. Also, like, what a f weird thing to like, you know, you picture in those moments when you're in your head being like, what are you doing? And like, you know, it's like kind of out of body. Your mouth is moving. And yeah. And I think as I get older, like, I forget how awkward I probably felt at like 19 or yeah. however old he is. You to know be able I mean? to hold up the mic and like show he's a charismatic guy. So I think it was cool to see that. But I'm going to go with jumping just because I like that more. I'm a huge fan of any kind of like, 
over the top bench celebration. Honestly, like any bench celebration. He at was all. not on the bench. Oh, he was just jumping. He was on the court by jumping. himself. That's even better. Jumping. That's even better. The, a play was not happening anywhere near him. He was just pumped. Okay, I like that even more because if you can find, like we were talking about silver linings earlier, like if you can find the energy to do that and you're like, this is the third last game of the year. They end yeah. the season on like a matinee, I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah. Which is like very, feels like appropriate for the season. So, you know, like if you're trying to be self-generative about your energy, more people should be doing that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did see a, a picture on Twitter of our injured players last night. So it was like Scotty Barnes and like Gary Trent Jr. And uh, Bruce Brown and RJ. Mm. And somebody was like, you know, like uh, your cousins at your auntie's house celebrating Eid. And it like, it looked right. Like it looked <laughs> completely accurate. And I thought that was really funny. Um, so that was also a highlight, uh, from last night's game. And I let everybody, I was like, everyone go eat pizza anyways. Cause Brooklyn is a, yeah. a pizza town don't hold and, out. You de and you deserve pizza. Like, come yeah. on, don't not eat pizza in Brooklyn. Yeah. Don't Just because you didn't win the game. That's the kind of coach I would be. You'd be a good coach. I, I would get you pizza. And, uh, you know what? Like I, I'm very like when I'm taking care of people, which I imagine coaches do, I'm very like motherly and I have to make sure you're well fed. Yeah. So it's that's important. Kinda, that's my, that's my move. So I would just constantly like my team would be the fattest team, but there'd be so happy they would be so and so, be so so happy and yeah. so so slow we're like oh, uh, we're bringing in a new brand of basketball <laughs> we we talk about a lot about pace in this game 90s nope. basketball no is more. back yeah uh all right katie well we'll wrap it up there uh thank you so so much for joining me uh thank let you. us know uh what you're up to uh if we have any uh, articles or any pieces that you have coming out soon that we can look forward to and of course where we can find you on the internet because i didn't put it in my name you can find me at whatevs uh w-t-e-v-s you can read and subscribe and listen to the podcast that i have at basketball feelings that's at basketballfeelings.com uh as i mentioned earlier tried to slip it in i wrote <laughs> A story about Russell Westbrook and the Clippers, yeah. and that's about SB. Um, I should have more pre playoff coverage there coming soon. Um, and then I'm just hacking away at this book, which you can hopefully get at some point in the future. Amazing. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining us as always. I suppose this is the time where I should ask you to like and subscribe <laughs> if you haven't already. Um, what are you waiting that, for? Trying to do that without coughing. Oh, my God. That was a struggle. <laughs> um, follow me if you'd like. I'd like you to. Why not? Um, I'll get better at this. But you know what? It's a future therapy session for me. And uh, I'll keep you all updated on how that goes. But I truly appreciate all of you for tuning in. Uh, to the show, whether it's on YouTube or on your podcast uh, thing of choice. Um, like I said, I will keep doing this throughout the playoffs and uh, the summertime, maybe a little uh, more infrequent during the summer, but it's an Olympic year. Uh, so I probably will have some summer content as well. Uh, thanks for staying with us, even though the Raptors suck. Uh, appreciate you so, so much. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Bye.